I don't want them running around town yelling, oh, gee, I got, I got hit by a default. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's, get, let's hit them where they need to be hit, and then they can say whatever they want to say about it. Potassium hydroxide is what he said in the video you are. Okay, potassium. Yeah, so, so we objected to this for a couple of reasons. One, this is all hearsay from Mr. Aiken, and we allowed him to testify about various things. Two, he's conducting some sort of investigation, <coughs> and he's really not qualified to do that. I mean, he's just a home delivery manager, I think. Right, so he's making an investigation, coming up with an extra opinion as to cause. I, I don't support the adding the concentrate. And, you know, adding the concentrate we like, the pump they like. Uh, and then three, I think it just gets right back to the pump issue, which we've already excluded. Four, if you take a look at the time frame, the pump not working in the middle of October, that doesn't relate to most of the cases, if not all the cases we're litigating here. You know, it certainly doesn't relate to the 2018, 2019, those three cases. It doesn't relate to Mrs. Ryerson. She's already in the hospital. It doesn't relate to, so there, there's no nexus here. And what I really object to about it is they're just throwing it in the document to make this pump some kind of potential alternative cause with no expert testimony. That, that's, that's what I would object to. Your Honor, I don't know if Teddy wanted to add before we go. No, I didn't. Your Honor, if you'll look at the real water, we would join in those objections. Um, all throughout the trial, and especially at the end of the trial, we heard this offer of proof that there was going to be some tie-in by Dr. Babcock for um, this testimony that we now can hear belatedly, and there has been no tie-in. Moreover, um, all throughout this trial, there's been an improper argument about um, comparative strict liability. And we went back and we researched this issue, and comparative strict liability was rejected by the Nevada Supreme Court in 1984 in a case called Young's Machine Company versus Long. The site is 100 Nevada, 692, 1984. It's been settled law in the state of Nevada that there is no uh, comparative strict liability, and that's the defense that's been put on here. That's the defense that they intend to argue after playing this testimony, after playing Lane Jones for about, it feels like about the millionth time in this case. And supposedly Dr. Babcock was gonna tie this all together and put a nice bow around it as it had something to do with the meter. That has not happened. This is just more cumulative, improper evidence. And we object not only to this video, but we object to again playing Lane Jones' deposition for no reason other than to distract the jury. Real water is admitted liability. This is improper. So this is uh, Anthony Brown. This is Rob Brown. Uh, this is Anthony Brown. He's the manager. He was the manager of the Henderson facility. He was Casey Aiken's direct manager. Okay. Um, much like, uh, and I heard there's some argument that he doesn't know he's on a foundation. Well, Jason Brown doesn't know either. So he we let his testimony in. So I don't think that's relevant. Um, I believe it's a statement against interest for one thing. So I don't I don't believe it violates any hearsay. Uh, rule, uh, you still, it still have, we still have the issue of causation and substantial factor, Your Honor. And here you have the, the manager of the facility who oversees the guy who's been dumping in too much of the hydrazine and saying, I think this is the cause, this is the, this is the problem. At least for the, in, in, in terms of plaintiffs, uh, I think the majority of four or five of them were injured right around the same time. So I think it's completely relevant. We've already heard earlier today from Blaine Jones talked about the pump issue, so that's no secret. He already testified about a conversation with, uh, with uh, Aikens about that. So I don't see any prejudicial effect of completing this and having the, the statements made by the manager in Henderson and Casey Aikens, direct manager at the time these events took place about the conversations that were had, the complaints that came in, and his conclusions as to what he believed uh, the problem was, and I, I think again, even though Your Honor has uh, not has inclined not to give a superseding cause, I would add this as further support and renew uh, my objection to that, Your Honor. And with that, I have nothing else, Your Honor. Mr. Robinson, I, I have nothing to add, Your Honor. But I support that. I join with Mr. Robinson. 
uh, just to respond to, to that, again, what does it have to do with the issues in this case? You know, this is an improper argument under Jefferson. This is an attempt at jury nullification. Look how bad real water is. It has nothing to do with the meter. Real water is admitted liability. Their argument about substantial cause, if real water was a substantial cause, well, that's been concluded by this court. But when we admitted liability, those questions for the jury go away from the jury verdict. The substantial factor test now is their meter. And this has nothing to do with their meter. This has everything to do with a pump or real water's conduct. Those issues are now off the table. Real water has admitted liability. The issue for the jury is, was there a need or a substantial cause or factor in the, in the plaintiff's injuries? And all those plaintiffs certainly speak for themselves. But this is jury nullification under Gunderson. It shouldn't be allowed. Especially, Your Honor, he's not an expert. So they are, they are wanting to give his consideration of the pump. And as you can see, he rejected the pump theory. He finally came back and said there's just too much concentrate. So not only do they not have an expert to say that, but this layperson is not even giving that opinion. But they want to throw out the potential alternative cause and say, oh, he considered it. They should have got a pump expert if they were going to do that, Your Honor. And with regards to the plaintiffs in this case, we have Mr. Haley, who's 2019. The Gallagher baby, 2019. We have Belsky, 18. We have the other four are 2020. I think two of them are before October 15th. Two of them are after. So there's only two of them they can even argue any kind of relevance to. But the real problem is this is expert opinion area. They didn't designate Anthony Brown as a potential expert. They didn't submit an expert report to Anthony Brown. They didn't hire a pump expert. And then they promised during the whole case, like Mr. Hughes said, and Dr. Babcock would tie this all up. But he didn't even mention the word pump in his testimony. So where do we get an alternative causation, i.e. the pump? Where is that support? Where is the foundation for that? Your Honor, their entire argument, well, no, no, I shouldn't say entire. That's probably not fair. But a large part of their argument about the implied warranty claim is Jason Brown's comments and talk with customers. He's not an expert on that. I don't think he's ever used one. That came in. The court's allowing that. That's okay. I don't want that in, but it's coming in. How is that different from this guy talking to his employees, he's the manager, about the process in his investigation, trying to figure out what went wrong and why they got these customer claims? Why is he qualified to determine what went wrong? Why is Jason Brown qualified to talk about whether it takes hours to days? That would be the same question. But not to be flippant, I'll answer it. He's the manager. He was the manager of the Henderson facility at the time and the direct manager of KCA. So that's how he's qualified. Wait, 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 wait. Because it appears to me, and that's why I asked multiple questions. He had the pump, potential malfunction, but he mentioned potassium hydroxide. Was that it? Potassium hydroxide. Hydroxide. Right. Dr. Babcock didn't speak about that. Yeah, but my point is this. He can speak about it. But here's the thing. And there's a significant difference in this respect as to what happened versus an investigation, right? And when you investigate, as far as this matter is concerned, it doesn't matter whether he's a manager and or alleged supervisor or whatever his position was. My question was, when it comes to offering up independent alternative causation theory, and that's basically what it is as to the causes of the injuries in this case, pursuant to the Williams case, right? Right. And I don't mind saying this. I was a trial judge in the Williams case, and I got a firm on that issue. And here's my point. You have to, when it comes to this type of issue, and it's independent alternative causation as to the cause of the liver injuries in this case, wouldn't you have to have an expert for that, right? That it can apply to a reasonable degree of medical probability. And just as important, too, I would think on another level, we'd have to have an expert in this case to look at the pump and opine regarding the pump vis-a-vis somehow causing or having a direct connection 
to the creation of hydrazine. <coughs> He's speculating that this other chemical has, right. which but has nothing to do with hydrogen. He's speculating well, that's what I that's what I asked the question about because that's the first time I heard about the uh, potassium hydroxide. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. What does that have to do with anything? It's a base material that that does affect the negative uh, ORP reading. Oh, yeah. And he testified that. Really that one. Yeah, but we're talking about hydrazine, right? But pump doesn't make disputed evidence is that hydrazine was found in the water. Yeah, but but and you're right, the pump doesn't make hydrazine. It doesn't, it just mixes it. Right, it mixes it. <coughs> it's not and, greatly, apparently. Yeah, but but that's kind of my point. I think just because that's what he thinks. Um, and I'll say this, I think that, that, that what was the doctor in this test? Right. 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 Yeah, he's a pretty smart man. That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. Or in Chicago, right? yeah, from Chicago, yeah, from Chicago, down, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm just partial, <laughs> but uh, and my point is, I don't like saying if, if I permitted him, and, and I'll say this: I've had a, a multiple causation opinion cases, and uh, I don't think I've got one incorrect yet, you know, as far as uh, review. And uh, this one here, I don't want to save you some time, and I understand why the defense wants. Uh, I should say. Um, the distributor defenses. I understand why they want this in, but I, I can't put it in. This is kind of an easy call. Thank you, Your Honor. And the final issue, this more Brown testing. Uh, I mean, Mr. Parker has more to say about it, but I mean, we had a direct discovery request for it. They, didn't they said it started in March and it wasn't finished. That's why they didn't produce it. They had to produce that, Your Honor. And then, then the other Laura Brown testing, this testing on the Milwaukee Hanna probes that were returned, also hasn't been produced. The five or more testing has not been produced. And, and on top of that, they were going to bushwhack us with this Laura Brown testimony by putting her on the stand without even telling us about the testing. Right, I, I, I just think this, this is pretty outrageous. And I'll leave the rest of this part. And, and Your Honor, we've gone over this a lot. The only other thing I would add is going through his deposition, volume two, he mentions that everything that he worked on, everything he's done, is in his job file. I can't imagine that he's performing some type of testing with Ms. Brown and it's not reflected in his job file. We were entitled to it under 16.12b, I believe, Your Honor. And uh, it was asked of him during his deposition. So we got the, now we have the interrogatory, we have rule 33, you have him being asked during your deposition. The request reduction under Rule 34. You know, when when does enough become enough? And and certainly that, those are multiple discovery uh, abuses. And I don't think the court should tolerate it. I think there should be a, a an appropriate sanction assess, assessed for it under Rule 37. Well, well, here's my question. I, I do understand sanctions under Rule 37, but. What, why would there be a sanction if ultimately the testing didn't come in? Your Honor, know, I would speak to that because we don't know what happened. It's really troubling to real water that there was an order by the special master in November of the year before that was appealed to the district court. It was upheld by the district court that basically if there was any testing of real water, it had to be produced in this case. But now we understand that the media defendants apparently tested the meter because they say, oh well, we only have to we only have to disclose if we test for the water, so we'll go test our meter. And we don't and apparently something happened in March. We know that Dr. Dabcock's testing, but is this the same thing or is this something different? And if it's something different, that has repercussions beyond just this case. That has repercussions for all 27 cases. And the direct answer question is some of the testing could have been favorable to plaintiff's I understand. And, and Dr. Babcock Dr. threw out two of the, when he tested 15 probes, he threw two out because they were favorable to plaintiff. And, and my question is this, I mean, not question, just to make sure the record's clear. We're talking, I would anticipate, testing of the platinum probes. That's and correct, we, And as it relates to condition. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, that's what they were doing. And, and Your Honor, I would add, just real quickly to that, that they withheld this and they, they're arguing 
that 48 hours in the tip card is enough. They, uh, Mr. Silvaggio, the president of Milwaukee, the vice president of Hanna, testified and suggested and inferred that testing had been done to validate that 48 hours. And so that that's in front of the jury. They withheld testing and then put evidence in front of the jury to suggest that they somehow validated this or this 48 hours is a, a, some sort of correct measurement when the evidence is contrary to that. And I would assume the testing is contrary to that. So they should not get the benefit of uh, no harm, no foul. You know, I want one question. And, and, and before you, before you start, ahead. Mr. Park, I yes, just, just want to make sure the record's clear. It was the testing of the, of the platinum probes um, to determine, I assume, uh, the rate of conditioning by uh, utilizing vinegar. Which is the heart of this case. Right. Sure. They, they, they said that Byron, whatever it is, more than testing, right. which has never been produced. They said this Laura person did testing in March that wasn't finished, which has never been produced. Uh, they said that she was testing uh, uh, returns, both Hanna and Milwaukee, which has never been produced. Nope. And then on top of that, they brought a witness in to testify about <coughs> without producing all this stuff. So that, that's my real complaint. They were trying to push it. So they were intentionally trying to take advantage of their failure to do testing. You know, I, this is you know, somewhat uh, academic, and, and I think it should be persuasive based upon the case law. The cases that deal with spoilation, typically the withheld information is information helpful to the other side. That's why I typically have the, at the worst case scenario for the moving party, you have an inference. In this case, like Mr. Uh, Kemp and Mr. Pepperman said, we don't know if that information would have been beneficial to the plaintiff's position, and that's why they didn't produce it. And so simply to say, well, they didn't get a chance to put the test information up or it wasn't used, that's not the standard. I understand. I understand where you're going. Okay, so that's the, that's the problem. The, I, I, was, I had this issue come up before, and the question was from the court, well, Mr. Parker, they can't use the information since they didn't timely provide it. Ultimately, the court found out that not only the, them not using it was beneficial to the non-moving party because they didn't want it to be found. So rules 37, the, the uh, sanction is you don't get to use untimely produced documents or witnesses. They didn't want that witness to be identified in the spring in the uh, Sunrise Hospital case because in that case, the, the uh, nurses knew that the employee for the hospital was acting differently and provocatively around women patients. And those witness statements, they didn't want to come out. So they didn't identify the nurses, and the statements didn't come out. Eventually, not only was Sunrise, I believe, uh, sanctioned, but the attorneys were sanctioned for failing to produce it. Now, in this case, we know that testing was done at least by involving Mr. Babcock and Ms. Brown. And you know, Mr. Rasmussen is shaking his head affirmatively, so I appreciate that. We know that uh, Mr. Moore, the predecessor to Mr. Jason Brown, did testing that we've not seen. We do know that that information pursuant to 16.1 should have been produced. We now know because of having it up on the screen that we did a, a, an appropriate request under Rule 34. We do know we did a request under Rule 33, and we do know that the documents haven't been produced. They also said everything remaining is around. And the other thing that Mr. Pepperman just pointed out, in response to the request to produce, they said the information is in Romania, and the HANA Romania SRL. Which, again, Your Honor, how could that be true if the testing resulted in Ms. Brown bringing them to Mr. Babcock. To my knowledge, Mr. Babcock does not live in Romania. And his office is not in Romania. So I would suspect that that happened somewhere in the United States. So again, that would lead to custody, control, or control, I would say. And either way, Your Honor, Mr. Salvaggio testified he's been to Romania a hundred times in the past three years. A hundred times he's there. They can't produce the testing that's in a co-sister company. And so the final thing, Your Honor, and 
you having discussed the, uh, the rules, when someone tells you during his deposition that everything is within his job file and it's not, that, that's, that's a bald-faced lie. And fortunately for us, Mr. Rasmussen was forthright enough to tell us now what happened. And it disproves what Mr. Babcock said under oath in his deposition. So, Your Honor, I don't, I mean, I hate to put it in front of you like this. This is developed during this trial. No party should have to deal with this issue or these issues. And I do believe when you consider the case law, when you consider Young Rivero and his progeny, I, I don't know how you not have to design, challenge with having to design the appropriate sanctions given the conduct. The uh, abuses here are, I think, prolific, and I don't know how you clean it up. I'm sitting here trying to figure out curative instructions. None of them seem adequate in my mind because you got a lot to clean up in, in front of this jury. And certainly, given the comments Mr. Savaggio said, there's been no testing on any appropriate oxidation method. There's been no investigation on any uh, appropriate oxidation method. That seems to also fly in the face of what Mr. Uh, Rasmussen has told me, because I can't believe that Mr. Rasmussen is said to have brought 15 meters to Mr. Babcock for his testing. I did not. Well, I did not take them to I didn't say you did, but on page 63, line 21 through 64, line 13, he believes that 15 meters were provided to him by Hannah's counsel. So maybe that's not you. Maybe Ms. Brown's in an attorney. No, 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 she's not. So I, I'm just reading from the deposition, Mr. Rasmussen. You're, you're right, but it, that's a mistake in his plan because they were actually sent to him from Hannah. Okay. I, Your Honor, you see how the discrepancies abound here. Yeah. And I'm not attributing to Mr. Rasmussen, but I am attributing to him. And so, is I have been probably the most quiet person in the room today, but it's given me chances to look through this, these documents, the discovery. And I think, Your Honor, there is something we need to discuss with uh, Real Water. I think it does go back in part to also the comments about not being sued before, trying to imply that their product is not a a, a bad product or something that may have lended itself to where we are today. Um, and when you couple that with what we got here in front of us now, um, I think we'll be prepared early on uh, Monday morning to propose appropriate sanctions. Sir, is there anything you want to say? Not at this time, Your Honor. I understand. It's late as I did. I don't expect that, but I didn't want to overlook it. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Mr. Robbins. I, I just want to add. Uh, my recollection of the, uh, I just heard the Brian Moore dropped in here. My recollection is Mr. Savaggio said something about it. He may have done it. And then when pressed further, he said, I got no personal knowledge. I don't know. So there's, and then, there's no, been no testing. I've never indicated testing. I don't know of any testing. So the only testing I know about was excluded by this court. Your Honor. Okay. I would say that Dr. Babcock did do testing that this court excluded. <coughs> so testing was done on a <laughs> meters, that testing was provided to Texas Council. All right. Uh, this is what I'm going to do, and I, I'm not going to do anything right now, uh, but I think this is important from a record perspective because I will admit I don't have an infallible computer like recollection of every statement made in the course of this trial, right? And in a general sense, I do remember a lot of the testimony. But when it comes to the specifics as it pertains to testing, I do recall it being mentioned, but in what context and so on. Uh, what's one advantage we do have, and uh, Mr. Parker, and I know you know how to do this, uh, you can have, uh, can we even get an expedited transcript and get that? Because I just want to know what's in it. I want to see it in context. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Because I have to, before I even consider any sort of sanction, I have to know exactly what happened. And I don't want this case to be retried, if possible. And then um, I know we also have the Beatty versus Thomas issue uh, that hasn't gone away. But whatever you think would be appropriate, tee it up, make sure they get a chance to look at it. Uh, and then I guess as far as testimony is concerned, it, 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 it's there, it's there, if it's not, it's not. But we'll find out. Yes, so I'm not going to make a decision right now because uh, I've had to let make a lot of decisions in this case. Right. So, Judge, when do you want us to get that filing in? 
I would um, Monday morning this at nine o'clock make sure I have a copy so when I come in I can read it because I would anticipate. I mean, uh, it's not like I have to read an entire deposition transcript. I would anticipate there might be if there are applicable. Um, sections of the testimony, it might be a page or two, right? And they can, and just as important, uh, that's important from a record perspective. We all know that. Yeah, yeah we can file it Sunday by five. That's fine. Sunday at six. Your Honor, you're talking, talking about the Beatty versus Thomas? Well, that's another issue. I just kind of threw that on because we have two issues right now pending. We have uh, the issue regarding the test, and I kind of get that. I, I, I do. I shouldn't say kind of get it. The allegation is essentially this. Look, Judge, if there was testing done, um, it was hidden. And I understand it's an allegation. I'm not saying, I said if there was testing done. There was testing done, Your Honor. Okay, but, but I, I, I get that. But, but my point is this. They're saying, I guess, additional testing. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. But uh, if, it was, if it was, it should have been disclosed. And the only reason they wouldn't disclose it, it would have been favorable to the plaintiff. That's their position. This is, okay. That's what they're saying, right? That's Mr. correct. Barker? That is correct, John. I get it. You know. yes, Sean. And consequently, it wasn't produced, and we should have a, a, an inference or such. I mean, I get that. That's it. Because but the, the, but the testing, an irrebuttable presumption, the minimum, Your Honor. Well, well, but I'm not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. I'm just pointing out what the law says, right? right. It can be an inference. If it's negligent, it can be. Uh, a presumption if there's something more. I mean, I understand what the last, that's uh, Bass Davis. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I understand. But before I can consider that, I have to have a complete record. Yes, sir. Right, and I did. And I'm sorry, I apologize. One last thing. Um, previously on the record, we discussed redactions to exhibit one. Um, I had um, Ms. Switzler in my office go through the admitted exhibits to see if there were any others, and we determined to, that redactions were necessary to exhibit one, two, three, and four. I have redacted copies of they, each of those exhibits. What were the redactions? Are they all due to the ceased operations or something? Like yes, they reference it's the FDA and establishment okay. inspection report for the okay. report. And I have highlighted copies I can give them so they can review. I just want to give it so we want to substitute those in for the ones that are currently. Yeah, sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. If I could approach the. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can use that so we may get you off the top Yes, you can. All right. Barbara 16 is now in session. Arnold, do you want to be second? Please be seated. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's go ahead and set forth our appearance for the record. Uh, you know, we'll camp there. I've been with the plaintiffs, I think Mr. Parker's and with the other departments for a couple more minutes. Good morning, Your Honor. Joel with you and Matthew Coffin, we have the Real Water Community Lifestyle Site on the Real Water Gold Coast. Good morning, Your Honor. Scott Rathis and Ryan Cloudy on behalf of Matthew Coffin. We're taking a poll with your friends, Mike Street. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Rob Robbins and Elizabeth Wall. All right, once again, good morning. And so tell me, where are we at as far as your instructions are concerned? So, Your Honor, I think we've got it down to just one or two lingering issues. We've reached a stipulation on the medical monitoring damages. So, we amended the instructions to uh, just instruct the jury to find past and future pain and suffering for each of the plaintiffs. And then um, on the may versus must language on the punitive damages instruction, we, in an effort to compromise, we amended the instructions to use may instead of must. The last wording language was on um, the introductory 
damages, personal injury damages, and introductory wrongful death damages, where there was a dispute over whether we use you must calculate damages or you must award damages. Uh, we think this is somewhat a minor issue, but award is probably the, the correct way to say it. Um, I don't know if there's still an objection to using award, but that's what's in the uh, stock jury instructions, and uh, we think that that's just a better term to use. Is that it for disagreements? Um, the only other one is on the breach of implied warranty instruction. Right. Um, Milwaukee has proposed its own set of instructions on that claim. Uh, we disagree with those. We think our um, instructions are appropriate and streamlined and conform to the evidence and rulings in the case. And so uh, I don't know if they have any, what their position is on that, if they're just submitting theirs for the record or, uh, but that's the only other one besides the calculate versus some work. I also, in the, I did, Scott Rapp, on being, uh, I had requested out of the stock ones, uh, jury instruction 10.21, punitive damage with regard to conscious disregard. Somehow that didn't make it in. It's just one of the stock ones that I thought was in. Yes. It's one of the stock ones. Well, I amended the punitive damages instruction to reflect the definitions that are in the current version of the statute, uh, NRS 42.005, and that defines conscious disregard in that instruction. So that instruction is just part of the definitions of malice, uh, oppression, fraud, conscious disregard. So that one's in there, it's just not a separate instruction. No, I understand, thank you. And I, and I think it's important to point out, <clears throat> if you take a look at the, uh, the, the, um, 1986 jury instructions, you have 10.20, which has in it malice, oppression, fraud, then you have a separate instruction for conscious disregard. And I think the important point to remember is this, this is pretty countrywide, right? And uh, countrywide clarified a lot as far as that's concerned. And we can all agree, I think Justice Perry did a wonderful job on that because he, he reminded us that, you know what, at the end of the day, this is all statutory basically what he said. And uh, he talked about specifically what it was, something more than gross negligence. I mean, you know, we all know the language. Uh, it has in that case. But, uh, and I forget which, I think it's footnote 55 that's really important because it discusses conscious disregard and having the intent to harm. And the only, only quibble I have with the decision is essentially this, they should have put that in the <laughs> body of the written decision. But I think I think it's footnote 55. Might be wrong, but I'm almost by Mr. Sir, ma'am. Um, regarding uh, the two instructions for breach of implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, I think they're 32, page 32 and 33 in my copy. Okay. Um, and ma'am, I don't want to cut you off. I just want to make sure we have everything resolved before I get to those. Okay. I, I'm not going to be long, but... No, I, no, no, no. That's okay. But, but so I have to... What's the one dangling issue before we get to that? The calculate versus award. You know, what, which instruction is this based on? I think there are a few of them. Um. So when we instruct on... That, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. Yeah, it's just the introductory instruction where we say you must award damages for each plaintiff. Uh, there was a question of whether we should say calculate damages uh, or award, and I think it sounds like there's really no strong dispute there. We included award and I think that's preferable. It doesn't sound like there's an objection. No objection. Okay. So we can move on. So the other, only other two issues, I guess, two instructions we have to worry about now would be the proposed uh, implied warranty. Is that it now? Um, I think Mr. O'Dill. Oh, Mr. O'Dill. There, um, Your Honor, there was a typo in 10.05. If that's been fixed, then I agree. It, it is not. Um, I have uh, Ms. Switzler at my office. She's standing by. 
once we finalize all these, I'm going to tell her what the little differences we need to make. She's going to finalize them, put them in the proper formatting and form, and get it, get them down to court uh, immediately. And there's no dispute as to Mr. Odu's clarification on this instruction. We will uh, fix that, and it'll be reflected in the final version. Nothing further from us. All right. And before we discuss the instruction, can I have a co copy of that? Um, I think was. May I approach on? Yes, you can. These are the same instructions that you received on Friday, with the exception of the first two pages. We have to talk about the curative instruction too. Was there an agreement on that? No. Okay. All right. We got that. All right, ma'am. You have the floor. Um, I'll be short. I we submitted proposed jury instructions for breach of implied warranty of fitness based on the statutes. We just took the instructions out of the 2018 jury instructions because the 20, um, sorry, 1986 jury instructions don't have them. Um, as you said, when you were talking about the punitive damages, you know, this is a statutory claim. It's based on statute. Um, we don't think the two instructions on 32 and 33 correctly state the law as discussed in the statutes. They leave out some elements. I don't think the jury could make a decision based on the law with the information in these two pages. And I'll just have one comment on that, because remember this, this is important to point out. Uh, the statutes in, at question are based upon uh, Article 2 of the UCC, but you do have common law and breach of warranty claims, too, that, that, that were there prior to the uh, UCC enactment. But, um, so what, what, when I'm looking at this, I'm trying to look, see, where I, you know what, I don't even, I don't even think I have it. it it's interestingly, um, what's the most recent version again? So yeah, Judge, you're going to bring that up. I, I really object to a party salting the record on appeal by tendering with brand new jury instructions hours before the closing argument, weeks after they were supposed to submit. So that, that's really what's going on here. They've got brand new instructions we've never seen before. The clear intent is to go up on appeal and say, "Oh, we proposed these to the judge, and the judge rejected them." Uh, so, so I object. It's not timely in the first place. Uh, but the second place, some of these instructions are so ridiculous, like by the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs in this case gave timely notice of the breach of warranty. So they're saying the plaintiffs had to do it. That's page uh, four. Page seven, uh, the plaintiffs purchased the MW500 meter. That's clearly not right. We have to prove that the plaintiffs were relying on Milwaukee's skill. Uh, you know, the... Uh, Next one, eight, plaintiff's examination or refusal to examine the product is a defense. That voids the whole claim. You know, so, and then the, number nine, if plaintiffs did not give timely notice, they lose this claim. Uh, I mean, they, these are really ridiculous, Your Honor, but, but more importantly, it's too late, you know? Uh, they can put anything in the record they want, obviously, but to come to the court an hour before uh, uh, I'm supposed to start opening statements, closing statements, and you know, have a bunch of new instructions that were due a month ago, uh, and sh surely should have been tendered two weeks ago if they were serious about it. It's just an attempt to salt the record on appeal, and they're going to wave these instructions around and say, Look, we proposed these, we proposed these, Judge Williams didn't give them. That's just improper, Your Honor. So, I mean, if they want to talk about the two instructions that, that happened in the record for weeks, if not months, uh, finesse them a little bit. I, I wouldn't object to that, but, but this attempt to salt the record, I think, is, is clearly appropriate. And your honor, may I respond? Uh, I, I, you can, man, but I think Mr. O'Doyle okay. has a 
about this? Your Honor, we would join in, in those arguments and even point out on page 12 of the proposed instructions. They went in instruction the conduct of rural water was extraordinary, extraordinarily negligent and was not a normal consequence of the defect of the MW500. There's no evidence to support that. We've heard the warnings expert. We've heard Dr. Babcock fail to tie all of this testimony together. This has been an absolute sham of the defense. And now we're trying to get a jury instruction on it at the last minute. And as Mr. Kim said, salt the record. That is improper. Ma'am. Uh, yes, Your Honor. On page 13, I would like to point out uh, until Friday, we did not have a ruling on whether on whether NRS 104-2318 applied. And that is what allows plaintiffs to come in. And the, the court ruled that you know plaintiffs are allowed to come in, but until Friday, we had no idea, you know, it was it would be impossible to draft jury instructions saying plaintiffs, because that we didn't know what the ruling was going to be. In addition, uh, the superseding cause that we're talking about, that was proposed much earlier. The second amended, you know, we've submitted the only change between this copy that your honor is looking at and the copy we submitted Friday are the first are a response to the in the first two pages the previous previously requested instruction defining substantial factor we made that orally at the very beginning of the discussion here and the response to real water's proposed curative instruction the breach of implied warranty we were asked to draft this you know we had a whole discussion about whether plaintiffs yeah, be, before your honor ruled that they had a claim which I'm not, I can't remember what day that was, but it was, it was not two weeks ago. We would not have had any reason to propose a instructions for a claim for breach of implied warranty because we did not believe based on the court's ruling on July 25th regarding this motion for summary judgment, what the court said was, I'm granting this to a limited extent Milwaukee knew that the meter was used to take negative reading. We did not have any idea that the court at that point was adding a claim. And actually, it doesn't sound, you know, I'm going back to what I heard you say, which was, well, I can always add a claim under 15B. Right. That's at trial. So why would be, you know, I don't know why I would be accused of being late for proposing instructions to a claim that was just added at trial. The reason it seems to be late is the motion for summary judgment on the question implied warranty claim was filed on June, in June, June. That was four months ago. And I tendered uh, proposed jury instructions on the crucial implied warranty claim. Uh, they knew it was in the case. They, they appeared at the argument on the motion for summary judgment on the crucial implied warranty claim. So to suggest that they just woke up over the weekend and realized there was an implied warranty claim. That's just not what the record reflects, Your Honor. And uh, I just, I'm just making my record because they're making it. And everyone has a right to make a record. How's that? Right. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let's look at the one thing we haven't discussed is the curative instruction. I don't think, right? That's correct, Your Honor. We, uh, Real Water had circulated a curative instruction amongst the parties. Um, since then, uh, additional information has come out through the course of this trial that is subject to a motion that, uh, uh, or not a motion, but a position paper that kind of filed last night. Um, so it may not make sense to talk about the curative instruction until we talk about uh, the additional issues that have arisen during the trial. The big difference between the curative instruction that Hannah is proposing is it doesn't acknowledge that they have made improper argument in Nevada law, which is what was in the uh, the real water curative instruction. But we don't think the curative instruction cures the prejudice to real water. And I'll, I'll save those arguments for when we get to it. Okay. And your honor, on the plaintiff's curative instruction on the um, prior lawsuits issue, I prepared a uh, proposed instruction this morning and have brought copies if I could uh, provide it to the court, Brian. You can, and you can make sure everyone else gets a copy of it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Chairman, I haven't your copy of what real water he proposed. I have I have, I have, I have the response to the real water's proposed curative instruction. I think that's being given it to Mr. Carman. Bring it up. Looked at both, and I have the proposed curative instruction, I guess, from Milwaukee. Instruction under Baby Green Thomas? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And so, Your Honor, I, I would just to add to the instruction, um, we, we do think that it's important that it, it's made known that Mr. Salvaggio's statement was not accurate. Uh, it was not accurate. He said he had never been, Milwaukee had never been sued in 25 years when uh, we know he's been sued in. Uh, several other cases, even if you look no further than the real water actions. Um, but that's not relevant if the jury should not consider it. And the reason is in line with exactly the rest of it. I took exactly from the language from BD that that existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant to whether the NW funder was defective due to inadequate warnings. Uh, or fit for a particular purpose of taking negative work readings, and the jury should be instructed that Mr. Salagio's inaccurate statement uh, should be disregarded. Your Honor, um, we don't want to make sure that the trustee goes far. It's pretty clear that the testimony that was elicited was improper in the region versus Thomas, but it's also clear that. The pattern of questioning wasn't just asked in Milwaukee. After providing the improper testimony that Milwaukee has never been sued, uh, the witness was asked, now you're also an employee of Hannah, correct? I am. Okay, do you get a paycheck from Hannah? I do. The implication there is Hannah has never been sued. So I argue that uh, Milwaukee and Hannah have never been sued, and so it should go to both of them, All right, and, and tell me, do you have a, other than both defendants, uh, yeah, both defendants, and I should say distributed defendants. Um, any other uh, disagreement as far as the language is set forth in the proposed instruction by plaintiff? We do not. This should be both Hannah and Milwaukee. All right, next. Okay, this, the response to the water's proposed to the instruction. You know, I've just seen this, <coughs> I just see some grammatic things that I would like to change in this uh, word regardless. I don't think it's needed. This is just the question and answer proper. Many factors impose upon the weapon the existence of or absence of any of the losses is irrelevant to your determination. Period. Uh, the next one is the B, and it should say that because it is true that Milwaukee and the department was defective. Uh, well, so the problem is you have to start, I guess, with the word weather, but maybe a run on sentence there. Whether the Milwaukee MW500 ORP meter, we'd like to be, say that, was effective due to inadequate warnings 
or whether it was fit for a particular purpose of taking negative ORP readings, then this statement, while making alkaline water, it was making alkaline water. That would be, a, who was making alkaline water was, was not us, it was um, uh, real water. So I, I just don't see that this is true. Uh, I think that run-on sentence needs to be broken down. Therefore, I'm thinking regarding Mr. Silva, I just start an inaccurate statement and the walk had never been sued in another case. That's really all that needs to be said. This run-on sentence in between, I don't see that as needed at all. Uh, it's, again, just instructing them on, on something that's not relevant to this uh, improper question and answer. So, since there's inaccuracies in that second sentence, many factors have put the final the lawsuit period, I would get rid of the rest until we're there. Therefore, therefore, I'm instructing you to disregard Mr. Savage an accurate statement that no one has ever been sued in another case. Mr. Robbins. Uh, thank you, Aaron. We would go with our uh, curative instruction first of all, but if you're inclined to use this one, um, I, I would like clarification. Uh, and the question's clearly improper under Beatty, so I'm not arguing that. But um, in terms of inaccuracy, that the statement was inaccurate, is it because there's other real water litigation or were there other lawsuits out there? I don't understand no, where that's coming. Not. Well, there, we, we found at least other lawsuits involving Hannah and Mr. Mr. Salagio. And it, it is, even if, if you're just looking at the, whether the accuracy of the statement, it's okay. not accurate because they've been sued in Hannah. many other cases involving real water. Hannah, not Milwaukee. Milwaukee's My been question. sued in the other real water cases. The question was, has Milwaukee ever been sued? I didn't ask the question, has Hannah ever been sued? And Milwaukee has been sued in multiple other real water cases. Okay, that's why I think that that's before this one. Yeah, I just want clarification. Clarification. Um, my suggestion would be, you know, if you're going to go with this proposed instruction is, um, you know, the first paragraph I'm fine. And the second, I think after it says, regardless, the question and answer were improper, I would then just wait, add. Wait, 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 I want to follow you, sir. Okay. So you have the first paragraph. Right. Okay. And then the second paragraph, I would just start it with the final sentence. Therefore, I'm instructing you to disregard Mr. Silvagio's statement. And I would get rid of an accurate and statement that Milwaukee has never been sued in another case. And the rest of it, I would argue, is superfluous. Thank you. Any issues regarding, I just want to make sure, it, as to whether or not uh, plaintiff's proposed curative instruction under Beatty B. Thomas is an improper statement of law? That's not your argument. All right. So we're going to circle back. You can respond. Um, I'm fine adding the orc meter to after MW 500, but I think the rest of the instruction is it's exactly in line with the facts and the law. And I do think it's important to explain why we're telling them to disregard that. Because, uh, and, and we're neutral, it's the existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant to your determinations in this case. Specifying that this has nothing to do with, with the claims, I think is important to cure the prejudice from the testimony. So it's not a, an instance where, uh, there, it's not clear that you know this is some possible consideration, or you know whether they start inviting speculation and how it's inaccurate. Uh, I think stating it, just stating it's inaccurate, is um, necessary. But even that in, invites some some questions, and so to to avoid going uh, further into the inaccuracy, I think we have to explain why this is irrelevant and why it should not be considered. Um, I, I don't think it is harmful, it's the truth, and I think if anything, it's, it's almost um, gracious to 
defendants because it suggests that, look, it, whether they've been sued or not, whether they've been sued or not is irrelevant. All right, what about from a stylized perspective? I'm looking at paragraph, first paragraph, where it says regardless, should that be therefore comma? The question sure. and the answer was improper. I think regardless is the proper word because it's not saying there, no, Mr. Salvaggio's statement was not accurate, therefore the question and answer were improper. The question and answer were improper because it's irrelevant. So I think it's important to say that the answer was inaccurate, the testimony was not accurate, but that doesn't but matter. But that's not what I'm saying. I mean, I'm just talking about from a stylized perspective, therefore, versus regardless. I have no objection to regardless. No objection. You like regardless better? Okay. I mean... No, no, no. Uh, no. If there's no objection to regardless, I'm not, I'm not going to rewrite your instruction. It would be regardless. I just want to make sure you understand that. I'm not, I'm not. What about uh, question and answers were improper? I guess there's no issue there except for, I guess, in general objection. Let's move on to the next uh, paragraph. Many factors influence the filing of a, law, of a lawsuit and the existence or absence of other lawsuits. Is it relevant to your determination? whether the NW-5 was effective due to inadequate warnings or whether it was fit for a particular purpose of taking a negative warp reading while making up my water. Let's talk about that one quickly. I mean, the many factors influence the filing of a lawsuit, I can see is maybe a little superfluous. Wait, wait, where are you at there? Just first time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of agree. <laughs> but I, I, I would start with the existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant to your determination and the rest of the time. How does, how do you, how does the uh, defense feel about taking out any factors influencing the filing of a lawsuit? I think you can go all the way down to therefore I'm instructing you in disregard. It's factually inaccurate to say that ORP reading while making alkaline work because it infers that the OR that Milwaukee was in the business of making alkaline water. Your Honor, the, the purpose for which that testimony was elicited was proved exactly what is here now, or to disprove it. And that's why this instructive is informing the jury that that shouldn't be a consideration in determining whether or not the warning was adequate. Mr. Rasmussen asked that question to gain that inference, and that needs to be addressed. And this, this sentence, the rest of the sentence, of course, addresses that inference. Now, um, Mr. Rasmussen, if the ORP meter wasn't being utilized for the purpose of taking negative ORP readings while making alkaline water, what was it used for? Not sure, Your Honor, what they were using it for. Based, based upon the evidence. And the ORP meter cannot make alkaline water. And what, is, what it doesn't say is who is making the alkaline water. The inference would be that Milwaukee is making alkaline water. That's just not true. Your Honor, the one of the similar wait, opinions wait, wait, offered. Wait, 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 Mr. Barton, we'll go to Robbins and we'll come okay, back. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just okay. gonna ask so. I apologize. <laughs> go ahead, sir. You must have got more sleep than me this week. I do. <laughs> um, no, go ahead. Is there anything else you want to add to that? You said, well, well I'm going to answer your question directly. I, I think they were using it for both positive and negative work reading. Um, so just getting back to the language, so I'm fine with cutting out the first part that Mr. Pepper had discussed and starting with the existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant to your, I would suggest to say to your determinations 
in this case, period, rather than restating the, the claims, uh, and then finish with, now you get to your therefore stylish, uh, style uh, comment, Your Honor. Therefore, I'm instructing you to disregard Mr. Silvaggio's, um, I would cross out an accurate, and we've already said it's a not accurate statement that Milwaukee has never been sued in another case. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Thank you, sir. We'll circle back, Mr. Barker. So Mr. Pepper is pulling it up, but I have a pretty good recollection of Mr. Babcock's report. <coughs> but I believe Mr. The original. Mr. Babcock testified that the primary determinant for the amount of concentrate, the E2 concentrate, was the reliance on the ORP meter readings. So for Mr. Rasmussen to now say that his own expert's opinion should be disregarded in terms of the use of that ORP meter for purposes of real water, determining how much uh, E2 concentrate to put in its water, makes no sense. And it's, it's, it was asked this court to ignore his own expert's testimony. I'm trying to find the exact opinion, but I believe that's very close to the, uh, to what his opinion is, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Parker looks at that, Your Honor, I would just add, this, this is consistent with the other instructions. This is what they're going to be instructed. You're to determine whether the warnings were inadequate. You're to determine whether it was fit for this particular purpose of uh, taking negative ORP readings while making alkaline water. That's based on the summary judgment ruling, the partial summary judgment ruling on our motion for summary judgment number six. So that's what we're explaining. Just like Mr. Parker said, they asked the question to gain the inference that, oh, our warnings were inadequate or our product was fit because we've never been sued before. So this is just a factual and accurate statement that says whether they've been sued or not is not relevant to your determinations on the claims in these cases, which is whether the warnings are inadequate or whether it's fit for this particular purpose. Here we go, guys. I found it. This is conclusion number two of his report, real water used ORP as a primary determining factor for whether a proper amount of mineral concentrate was added to their product. That's their expert's opinion, Your Honor. And to now try to run away from it because of a baby violation that they created is inappropriate, Your Honor. And this instruction fits to the circumstance. I don't think Mr. Babcock testified to that conclusion using the word primary in his testimony to the jury. Thank you. Right. Mr. Babcock was asked that question on cross by Mr. Uh, Peppermint. In fact, I reviewed it uh, during the weekend. So it's in the testimony. It's in the reason for primary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's the answer, make sure. All right. May I just make one more comment, Your Honor. Absolutely. Um, so I, I may agree, these are the two causes of action in there. We already have the instructions on yep. it. So again, I'm just saying it seems a bit superfluous to then put them in here in this curative instruction. I don't think it's necessary. I think it draws um, you know, kind of unnecessary attention back to those two causes of action. And that might be the, the purpose of why they want to throw it in there. But I don't think it's necessary because I agree. These are the two causes of action that, that Your Honor is going to allow the instructions to go to the jury on, and they are adequately uh, listed in separate instructions. I don't think we need to go here again. I think it's, it's, it's a bit extra, quite frankly. And I would suggest, like I said, after you know the existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant to your determinations in this case. Therefore, I am instructing you to disregard Mr. Salvaggio's statement that Milwaukee has never been sued in another case, and I think that's more proper to find. Last comment, Mr. Parker. Yes, Your Honor. This curative instruction wouldn't be necessary if it wasn't for the violation uh, committed by Hammond, Your Honor. Plain and simple. There's a reason behind it being a curative instruct instruction. The normal instructions would have been fine and adequate had we not had this violation. This, this curative instruction is being proposed to address the, the actual infraction committed by him. And that's why it's appropriate. Your Honor, 
this is the re we're trying to address the very reason that Hannah violated the rules. And they did it to suggest in the minds of this jury that because they've not been sued before, that their product has never been a, there's never been a product or issue from a warning standpoint or an instruction standpoint for the purposes of making alkaline water, or cane water, or any water. That's the inference and that's the circumstantial evidence Mr. Uh, Rasmussen was trying to get the benefit of by making asking that improper question and getting that uh, improper answer. So given the fact that they, he made that mistake, that Hannah made that mistake, and it appeared to me, Your Honor, I, you know, I've been through a few trials, it appeared that that question was, was, was prepared in advance of this uh, witness getting on the stand, and he was teed up to give the answer. And he did it, the question was asked very quickly, the response was very quick, we didn't even have time to object, and we're all sitting here knowing the rules, and as soon as we had that sidebar, we brought it to the court's attention. So, the point being, Your Honor, we need a jury of instruction for just that purpose, to try to take away from the jury any inference, circumstantially, that they may have uh, gleaned from that improper question and that improper response. And I would say, I'm being nice by saying improper. It was just a misrepresentation made by Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Savaggio. Perhaps in his words, it's an indirect lie or a selling point. Mr. No, Brown. I think that, that pretty is, much sums it up. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't want to overlook you, sir. Anyway, uh, I, and I think this is important to point out. <clears throat> as far as uh, the statement made regarding prior lawsuits, the existence or absence of them, uh, that type of question is never germane in a tort case. <clears throat> and that's why Baby Thomas uh, specifically addressed that issue. You just don't ask that question. Yeah, potentially prior events might come in as it pertains to issues like red flags and or potential notices to whether a product is, is defective. I mean, and, and that's one of the reasons why when it came to prior similar events, I went through that six-step analysis in that minute order because that comes in. But absence of doesn't come in because the thrust and focus in this case should be primarily as far as the uh, Hannah and Milwaukee uh, defendants are concerned, would be whether or not uh, there was adequate warnings uh, contained in either the uh, instruction manual and or, I guess, the tip card. That's really what it comes down to. And ultimately, that's an issue the jury's going to have to grapple with. Because, uh, oh, you know, when it comes to uh, strict products liability law, and we've discussed this many times in this case ad nauseum, you have your uh, manufacturing defect, you have the design defect, and you have inadequate warning or instructions. And so what I'm going to do is this, and, and I, I think uh, this is my impression, I don't mind saying this in open court and for the benefit of any reviewing court. Uh, the purpose of the uh, curative instruction is to remind the jury, number one, of uh, a potential issue that they heard, and in this case, it would be prior lawsuits or, or the lack thereof. And to disregard that, but just in, as important too is to remind them as to what their primary charge will be in this case. And that will be to determine uh, whether the warnings were inadequate or whether um, the fit for a particular purpose of a negative work reading. And, and what's interesting about the fit for a particular purpose, I think it was Mr. Uh, Savaggio would even testify to that in his examination. He brought that up. I don't know why. But uh, I'm going to give the instruction with the, um, with the changes that were discussed. Uh, and uh, no one had an objection to regardless of that will stay in. Many factors influence the following of a lawsuit. That goes out. We start with the capital and the, the existence or absence of other lawsuits. And that cleans it up. And we'll go with that. We'll add the term work meter after MW 500. That's fine. Any other issues? We're going to put the word Milwaukee ORP meter. That's what it is. Yeah, I mean, if we want to be, we want to make sure. Well, where's that at? That's at uh, <coughs> the existence or absence of other lawsuits is irrelevant. It's not where we're stopping. Are you just going to continue to go on? No, I thought I was pretty clear. Okay. Where you are. So then with the MW 500, if you Say what it actually is the Milwaukee MW500 or meter. 
Yeah. You know, I prefer not to put Milwaukee in there. Now, Mr. Hant, Mr. We can call him Mr. Hant. Mr. Rasmussen's question to Mr. Uh, Savaggio about a Hannah prior Hannah lawsuits seems to target now Milwaukee. Why don't we simply put MW 500 or maybe since we know Hannah manufactures it, one of Hannah's companies assembles it, Hannah buys the parts for it, and then Milwaukee ultimately sells it. Why do we need to highlight Milwaukee in front of the MW 500? I think we need it the way it is. It seems like he's trying to redirect the mistake to Milwaukee as opposed to his questions to his client. Sir? Again, the box is, well, it says Milwaukee right on the box, Your Honor. Right? You can see again. It says Romania on the box, too. You want to put that on there? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, though, remember this. This is, they're both. This, we're talking about the distribution chain, right? So, at the end of the day, if they make it a term, this is what their charge is, whether or not it was effective, based upon uh, two theories. Right? There's only one theory as to hand on Yeah. Okay. Yep. When you say well, only one theory is a Hannah, but but how do you now you want me to go in more detail as far as it's concerned? Just wanted to add the word Milwaukee in front of the Milwaukee MW five hundred or ORP meter. What does MW mean, Your Honor? Come on, talk. Okay. 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 Well, they know what the MW5 is, right? They're pretty clear on that. <laughs> I mean, do we have other instructions that address those issues? The distribution? The yeah, sure. well, certainly, this is not some yeah, that will die on, so go ahead. I'll just keep it, we'll keep it like this. So we, we are saying four meter, right? Yeah. Yes. And Your Honor, so I'm clear, this instruction will be given with the other jury instructions? Yes. What, in terms of placement, Your Honor, where, where are we planning to put this? Has anybody suggested that? I don't have all the other instructions on that issue. Uh, it seems to me maybe this should be right in front of the liability discussions. So when a jury uh, starts looking at the assessment of liability uh, as it relates to, for example, I haven't looked at them, but the products liability instructions and so on, this should probably go right in front of that. So when they start addressing it, they look here and they know exactly what to do. That makes sense, John. I was, uh, and I, we may be, Thinking the same thing, but my thought was to put it. Yeah, that's fine. I won't place it and reach an agreement. Any objection on that as far as placement? Then you If I'm understanding correctly, so would, I got my set last night, so I'm, but uh, after preponderance of evidence and for the introductory instruction, I'll propose it, and you can just let me know. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't have any of those. I was just, I was not talking about introductory. I was talking about discussions as to the liability, products liability. That that is the next page. You know, there's the introductory instruction, and then it starts with the elements for. Um, okay. Yeah. That's what. I'll mean. put it in an order and run it by everyone. So it could either be page 20 or 21. That's it. That's it. 
Now, in this packet that's been given to me, uh, I just want to make sure the record's clear on this. Have these all been submitted and, and uh, marked as proposed instructions? Got to do that. I, I will do that right now, Your Honor, if you're finalizing I'm talking, these questions. I'm talking about this packet. You got to submit it so it's part of the record. Oh, I thought you were talking about the main pack. No, I'm talking about your, your submitted, any instructions that were submitted and rejected. Marked as proposed? Yes, you got to do that under the rule. So I want to make sure it's not over. Can we do that in open court, Your Honor? Um, or do you want me to serve? Whichever is most efficient. So then I'm going to be some time today. Yeah, I mean, we just want to make sure it's not over. That's all. Because if you don't put it in there, you say, well, we propose these instructions that are not part of this. You want me to mark it or request to be marked in open court? Um, I think, uh, and I forget the exact words on that. I think there's actually a rule or statute that goes specifically with proposed instructions, but you have a process you have to go through. And yeah, you've always better marked it out. It's better to file it electronically, or you might be able to. You know. I've always marked it out. We're happy to file it. That's Whatever fine. you feel comfortable with is fine with me. Just want to make sure they don't get overlooked. What was the next issue? Yeah, I think that brings us to the last issue and probably the most important issue. Um, you know, as a preface in a product case, one of the most important things uh, in the discovery process is testing, whether there's been testing on the product. In this particular case, where you have conditioning and the impact or effect of that conditioning on the performance of the meter, whether it can take negative or in hours or days, uh, testing is particularly important. And because of this, we served an interrogatory and request for production on July 22nd, 2022. That was 14 months ago. On this precise point, we didn't rely on just 16.1. We served a request for production on this. Uh, and they responded to that request for production, saying, we don't have any testing. Don't have any, zero. It's all in Romania. Okay, so we find out Friday uh, that not only did they have testing, but they had three different kinds of testing that wasn't produced. First, they had testing by Brian Moore. And again, Brian Moore was the general manager of Milwaukee who died, and he was the originator of this so-called tip card. So now we find out for the first time on Friday that there's some sort of testing that Brian Moore apparently did with regard to this tip card. And uh, whether Milwaukee has it or Han has it, doesn't really matter, uh, it wasn't produced. Okay. But this testing must have been important because it apparently was the basis for him saying that 48 hours is enough. You don't need to do it for four or five days, despite the fact they're telling people four or five days. And Mr. Sabaccio brought this up during his direct exam, testing by Brian Moore. So that's the first type of testing that wasn't produced. Then on Friday, we find out that this Laura Brown person did some sort of secret testing starting in March that Mr. Rasmussen took the position that he doesn't have to produce because she didn't get done. Well, maybe she didn't get done, but this is the same person that he tried to put on the witness stand on Tuesday to talk about the testing that didn't get done. Uh, I just don't understand how they can think that there's outstanding interrogatory requests or in the middle of a trial, they can put a witness on to bushwhack us with secret testing and then not have an obligation to produce that testing. Uh, that, that's just, in and of itself, an outrageous uh, violation of the rules, Your Honor. Uh, the third testing is what Mr. Rasmussen referred to in his opening statement, and I've been kicking myself all weekend, Your Honor, but I must have been asleep at the switch, but he referenced testing by the EU on our product to show how safe and effective it was, and then he's pointing at this EU label on the box. Well, where is this testing by the European Union on the product? That's never been produced either. So we have three different types of testing uh, that haven't been produced that we find out about on the very last day of trial, uh, or second last day of trial. And there's no dispute that there was testing done. This is a direct quote from Mr. Rasmussen on Friday. Quote, Laura Brown has done testing, unquote. And then he says, she would be able to talk about the testing she's done because I haven't provided that. 
I can't do that. I don't know why he can't do that. It's his employee. But there was some, there's some secret testing, and this was referenced by Mr. Savaggio on the stand. Again, he referenced both the EU testing and the HANA testing. You know, unless there's some Ford secret testing, this must have been the Laura Brown testing. So, I mean, this violation is, you know, it, not only does it affect this case, but I just filed rebuttal reports on the next case in front of Judge Fisher, and now I'm now I'm finding out that there's three areas of secret testing that that haven't been addressed. So now they're impacting that that trial in the further trials. I mean, this is just such an outrageous violation. So, you know, when we start thinking about it, uh, now now what do we do? Okay, if this had happened two months ago, we would file a motion to strike the answer and enter default. That would have been the remedy. That is the remedy that Mr. Parker. Uh, has endorsed. I think Mr. Odu thinks that's the right thing to do. He can speak for himself. Uh, but we thought about it long and hard, Your Honor, and to strike the answer, we'd have to have an evidentiary hearing. That would delay the trial at least a day, maybe two. We might have to drag in Laura Brown. We might have to put Mr. Rasmussen on the stand. Probably have to bring back Mr. Savaggio. That's a lot of work to go through uh, to, to, to uh, support the court order, but that's what we would have had. To, what we would have to do. So we thought, and, and I'm not saying I disagree totally with Mr. Parker, Mr. Do, but we thought a lesser sanction might be uh, more appropriate. And so what we thought, uh, and what we proposed in the brief, is that there just be an admission of compensatory liability or a termination of compensatory liability for Hannah, just for Hannah, not for Milwaukee. Uh, although I think. You know, Milwaukee's got some planning to do too. You know, because if this testing was done by Brian Moore and it wasn't produced, why well, I didn't Milwaukee produce it? Okay, yeah, he died, but, but you know, when people die, the records don't disappear. And it, it was apparently prominent enough testing that Mr. Salaggio knew about it. Reference on the stand. Uh, but anyway, we thought we focused solely on Hannah because Hannah is the one that uh, I think is. And, and then they say in their response to request for protection 13, oh, if there's any test, they don't even concede there's testing, but if they say there's any testing, it's in Romania, and we don't, we don't have anything to do with what happens in Romania, even though the chief operating officer of, of uh, HANA goes to Romania 100 times, and even though, as he said, it's all one part of the HANA umbrella, we don't have anything to do with Romania. So they didn't even admit there was testing, and then they pointed the finger at Romania. But anyway, back to the remedy, Your Honor. So if there's a determination that Hannah's is liable just for compensatory damages, uh, they can contest the amount of compensatory. They can still contest the punitive liability determination. They can t contest the amount of punitive. I think that's a pretty minor uh, 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 determination based on what occurred, <coughs> OK? Um, and, and especially, like I've already said, this was not a surprise to them. You know, Mr. Savaggio, quote, to my understanding, Mr. Moore did some testing, unquote. So before he took the stand, he knew that we had more testing that was not disclosed. He knew about Mr. Moore. He knew about the Laura Brown testing that wasn't disclosed. They relied on it on the stand to tell the jury that their product was a wonderful product because it had been tested. Uh, so, in, in Mr. Uh, uh, Rasmussen's statement on the U, U, EU, he says, quote, which means it was tested, unquote. Where was that? <laughs> Where is that testing? Uh, but any event, Your Honor, that's the remedy we propose. Uh, you know, a couple advantages of it is we avoid any potential argument by Milwaukee that they're adversely impacted, although I think they're pretty deep in this, given that Mr. Savaggio is the uh, president of Milwaukee, and given that the uh, Brian Moore testing, he's their employee. I think they're real deep in it too, but that's not what we're asking for at this point. Uh, we're just asking that Hannah's uh, compensatory information be made. And the other benefit, I think, from that is if we go forward and there's a liability termination against Milwaukee, that kind of moves out, you know, this provision on Teal, which I always look at. If there's a finding that Hannah's liable for punitives, that moves it out for an issue on Peel. 
Uh, and, you know, we spent a lot of time gaming this out for future, Your Honor. I don't want, I don't want, for example, the Milwaukee situation is particularly dicey because they're insured by the same insurance company as Real Water. I don't want them running around town yelling, oh, gee, I got, I got hit by a default. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's, get, let's hit them where they need to be hit, and then they can say whatever they want to say about it. Uh, and so I'm thinking of the future impact of this a lot. And that's probably where, if this was just a one-off case, I think I'd be uh, holding hands with Mr. Parker and Mr. Rodeau on what we should do. But it's not a one-off case. It has a lot of consequences in the future, future litigation. Um, and so anyway, that's our proposal, Your Honor. Uh, and if the court has any questions for me, I'm, I'm free to answer. Uh, but I think Mr. O'Brien and maybe Mr. Park have something to say. Yeah, I'm going to listen to what they have to say when I hear from these guys. Mr. Park, I know the oh, lawyer. Right, I don't know if you have a copy of this or not. Uh, not right in front of me, but make sure they look at it first before you give it to me. I think they, we received that. It was either yeah, we served it yesterday before five. Those are the Chinese. You know, I don't, this is a long uh, document, the brief is fairly long, and it points out what Mr. Kemp has highlighted. But if you go to the opening, this is the transcript of the opening, Mr. Rasmussen's arguments to the, uh, or to the opening statement. The arguments to the jury, page 187, is towards the end of this, this document. Give him an extra copy. I didn't even get one. You can have mine after I. When you get there, I'll just let you know. No, 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 no. I, I mean, I actually, I understand what's going on. All right. So at page 187, Your Honor, uh, lines 19, and I'll go through uh, page, line, you know, on the following page. This is Mr. Rasmussen talking. <coughs> We've heard some stuff about Tesla. The CE up there tells you that the Milwaukee instrument conforms to the CE European directive. Then you get that stamp to say that, which means it was tested. Do we know, does my company know whether or not the real water, real water water was tested? No, we just know our product was, and it met and conforms to all of the directives in Europe because it's a European product. European product like Ferrari or Porsche or BMW or Mercedes or Volvo. Or <coughs> if I was over in Asia, it might be a Sony Wright or a Kia or a Honda Wright. Those are all foreign products. And, and can a foreign product be brought into the United States court? Yeah, yeah. But in Europe, it's going to manufacture something. I'm going to agree with those right there. And so, Your Honor, he goes in to talk about testing, which there's been no evidence in this case regarding any testing, U.S. or European. But now they allude to this testing that Mr. Spaggio did, in addition to this testing that never came in as evidence in this case, performed by Ms. Brown, uh, Mr. Babcock potentially involved, and then previously by the deceased Mr. Moore, which has been <coughs> introduced in violation of Rule 33, 34, 16.1, and 16.12b, which is a part of the expert's job file material. This was done over the weekend, trying to go through the, the numerous uh, documents and transcripts to put before the court, Sean. I suggested a striking of their answer uh, in, in total. Because I've been uh, a victim of seeing this happen before in other cases, that have gone before the Supreme Court and actually have published opinions. Uh, and it's happened during trial, period. not just before trial or during the discovery period, but during trial. And it took a whole week, and this is probably why I accept Mr. Kemp's position, that on my trial I had to stop a week so that we could do the evidentiary hearing and put lawyers on the stand. And those lawyers end up having to go to the, in front of the bar. Uh, so I'm not... I don't want to push this jury off a week. I don't want to go through the process of having to subpoena uh, witnesses if they're not being made available by uh, Hannah or perhaps even Milwaukee. I don't want to go through having to put Mr. Rasmussen on the stand. 
because I suspect they will bring in a new attorney, as they did in the other case, to uh, to defend their position. All of that takes time, and of course, we would have this this jury waiting either here or outside of this court until we can have that done. So for that reason, I agree with Mr. Kemp. I think it is a tempered position for us to take, but because I do believe that the conduct, the misconduct, deserves a full strike in the meals. That's my that's what my gut is telling me. But there are procedural requirements of the younger barrel that requires the evidentiary hearing. And in fact, I think in uh, the Bahina case, it was offered, the claim was offered, and the defendants originally, uh, the defendants, uh, I'm sorry, the defendants fought for the evidentiary hearing because the, tri the trial judge said, everything happened in front of me, I can make the decision without the evidentiary hearing. But in that case, Mr. Polsenberg said, we are deserved a evidentiary hearing. And that's what happened in the heat. Your Honor, I don't want to put this <coughs> off a week or however many days it would take to do the evidentiary hearing. For that reason, I agree with Mr. Kemp. But certainly the conduct deserves an appropriate sanction that I think is nothing less than striking your answer as liability on all counts. 